All right, this will be fun. Thank you, Absolutely. Lonnie, so much for taking time with us. And we're sad you couldn't be here in Los Angeles for the opening of the Obama Portraits, but we know you'll be in LA often. Thank you so much. And I'm so grateful for your leadership in making this work. Uh, um, I'm very excited. I just, uh, your biography is well known, but just for our audience, um, and formally, I, I just want everyone to know that uh, uh, Lonnie, or Lonnie G. Bunch III, who is, uh, you are the 14th Secretary of the Smithsonian, which I think it's fair to say is the largest museum and research organization in the world. So a big job, but you've been there since 2019. Um, and I think everybody knows you're already famous for being the director, the founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. And no one as much as me can respect the work, ingenuity, creativity, and can I say work again, <laughs> of starting with one staff member in 2005 and then bringing that extraordinary museum to life with I think 40,000 objects now, 6 million people have visited. And just the way it tells the story of, of the African-American story, not just in the United States, but to the world, um, is amazing and and that you are you're really a scholar and a historian <laughs> so your your management abilities are astounding to me in that sense that you've had this full life devoted uh to really also to museums and scholarship which is so touching to me and i just want of you were in chicago of your many of the many things you did i just want to underscore for our audience that you were here at the california african-american museum in los angeles uh, between 83 and 89 and organized uh, quite a few award-winning exhibitions, um, at the Black Olympians, 1904 to 1950, and uh, Black Angelinos, uh, the African-American in Los Angeles, 1850 to 1950. So we're going to get you back to have another conversation <laughs> just about Los Angeles. And I know it's a place you love. So I just with open arms, welcome you. And thank you, Lonnie, for taking this time with us in uh, Los Angeles with the world. Uh, well, thank you. You know, he said, I love Los Angeles. I love LACMA so much and I respect you so much. So the opportunity to have this chance with you means a lot to me. So thank you for giving us the time. We're talking on the occasion of the opening of the Obama portraits here at LACMA in Los Angeles. We opened this weekend with a huge family day uh, uh, open house with thousands of people. I was there all day yesterday from whatever, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. Amy Sherald had a conversation to close the day. A lot of happy people. And even in COVID, we kept everybody safe. Um, but the Obama portraits, of course, are part of the Smithsonian. You've generously lent them and toured them. So we're the at the moment the, the West Coast uh, destination for these portraits. But I know you've had a chance to really think about these portraits in terms of, I think of them as you know, changing our history, changing the focus on portraiture in our world, and changing minds. And I'm wondering as a historian if, I mean, give me your reflections on the importance of these two paintings uh, that sort of shocked the world and are, are still doing that. Well, I think in many ways, I was really struck that years ago, I curated an exhibition when I did do honest work as a historian on the American presidency. And I was stunned at the way the numbers of people wanted to know more about the presidency, had this fascination. I was struck by the fact that there are presidential street names in every city. And so mm -hmm. when we had the opportunity to, to um, share these portraits, I knew they were important on several levels. One is it really taps people's excitement about the presidency, but also it helps people reflect on the Obama presidency how transformative that was, and also how much that legacy is contested. But what also struck me more than anything else was the creativity of the artist. In some ways, part of what excites us is that this changes the way people think about portraiture. Uh, these are images that look different from many of the traditional presidential portraits. Obviously, um, with Kahindi and Amy, two important contemporary African-American artists, that by itself puts this into a different light. And ultimately what we really wanted to do was to encourage people to think about presidency, 
portraiture in new and different ways. And coming to Los Angeles, which is one of the places that has one of the greatest art museums in the country, but is also a place that helps people understand the diversity of our community, we thought it'd be very important for these portraits to be in LA. I, I know they're gonna be inspiring to so many. Um, you know, uh, little Parker Curry was here <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> Who was as every I think people everyone knows she's famous was the young the the, the young girl staring up at uh, Michelle Obama's portrait and marveling at it and I think that image was one of the most viral images of the last decades as it should be given how many you know other images have been thrown around that aren't as inspiring as that and there she was in front of the portrait so you could see you know children families it's inspiring. Um, one of the things we noted when we were opening the portraits is that um, you know, part of the reason that we wanted to show these and its companion exhibition, which is about 200 years of Black American portraits, to put the Obamas in the context of Black American portraits over 200 years, historical and present, there was that comment Kehinde Wiley made, who's from Los Angeles, when he unveiled the portraits, that you know, when he was growing up here, and going to LA museums, there weren't a lot of people on the walls that look like him. And so we dedicated ourselves in this exhibition to make a lasting impact. So not only, um, and you'll see it when you come to LA, not only have we put together an exhibition of 140 portraits by over 110 artists that really do showcase Black American portraiture, but we went on an effort to, um, it's all 80% is from our collection. And uh, there were almost 60 gifts made on this occasion so that they'll be permanently here in LA. Because, you know, what Kehinde said is it's real. It's about our culture if you don't see yourself on the walls of museums. And I, I think that's partly that's behind the museum that you made for us on the mall, right? In, in many ways, part of what excites me is that I've worked my entire career to make visible those that are often invisible and to give voice to the silent. Um, because there were often so many times in my career, I would go into museums and I would just be overwhelmed, not by the exhibitions, but by the silence, the lack of black voices. And, and so in some ways, what really excites me is the exhibition that you've put as a companion piece, because really it's more than a companion. It really, first of all, contextualizes the Obama portraiture. It helps people understand that African-American portraiture is not new. Um, but what it really does, in many ways, it's so powerful, it gives space to that expression. And what's powerful is that what you've done is you've recentered the Black voice and the Black lens when it comes to portraiture. And that is so important. And I think, as you used, told the story of Parker Curry, I think that that reminds us, um, and what Kahindi said, reminds us of the power of museums to inspire, to transform, to change the way people view, not just themselves, but their world. And I think that, so the notion of marrying the Obama portraits with the portraiture that you have, um, to, me, to my mind, is the perfect storm. It's really exactly what we'd like to see happen because now people will go through and see the Obama portraits, but also going through the exhibition that you have put together, people will realize that they now need to look at portraiture differently. They now need to go into other places and look for that black image, that black voice. So what you've really done is, is given people the opportunity and really the privilege to rethink what portraiture should mean and what portraiture does look like. It seems like it's the zeitgeist of the time, too, because we're talking about people all the time and we're talking about representation all the time. Um, you know, part of the reason for the show also post the murder of George Floyd, we, we had a portraiture show anyway planned, this idea of the diversity of people. And when, you know, when we saw all those images and all the negative images around the murder of George Floyd, the curators came together and said, let's focus on Black American portraiture and the stunning diversity within that. <laughs> so on the walls are, you know, workers, artists, institutional leaders. Uh, and so you see this splendor and beauty and abundance um, of, of, of black portraiture. And, and, and that's what's just, it's, it's uh, just, you feel the energy. It's a kind of sell on hang mm -hmm. to 
to uh, to feel that energy. And it goes from um, from 200 years ago in an oil painting. There's even a um, a work by Tavara Strawn, which is like a canopic jar, which was a project of in our art and technology project where he put uh, an image in homage of Robert Lawrence, the nice. astronaut who never was mm -hmm. could have been on Apollo 11. But with SpaceX, that little canopic jar artwork is now circling the globe. So he's been in homage placed around the globe. And there's a virtual augmented reality portrait of Biddy Mason <laughs> in this show. So hopefully it points to the future in ways that portraiture can extend beyond that, you know, oil painting of a person. But isn't that, isn't that in some ways, that's what's so powerful about it is that what you've done is you've expanded the notion of what portraiture is. But what you've also done is given people a real diverse look at African-American imagery. Traditional portraiture, even with African-Americans, traditionally found, followed a certain mold. And what mm -hmm. you're really saying is that there's a much broader way to understand this community through portraiture. Um, and as a historian of Los Angeles, anything you do with Biddy Mason makes me <laughs> unbelievably happy. <laughs> well, I, of course, and, and it's just, just like, like a clear thing that she was one of the wealthiest, most powerful women in Los Angeles. And there's hardly, you know, a picture that's accessible in our popular culture. Uh, and hopefully there will be more and more. Uh, so we're excited about that. So let me ask you, port this idea, can we take this idea of portraiture further? Because your big initiative at the Smithsonian recently, in the same time frame that we were just putting together a portraiture show, <laughs> you were putting together a huge nationwide initiative called Our Shared Future, Reckoning with Our Racial Past. So I think portraiture show is small, hopefully it'll have big implications, but I think they're, they're born from the same spirit uh, of drawing out the portraiture people uh, race and wellness, race and wealth, race and place, race policy and ethics, race beyond the U.S., and, and finally, of course, race, arts, and aesthetics. And I, I wondered if you could say a little bit about the origins of that um, and what you've done for the Smithsonian in, in that direction. Well, I really believe that cultural institutions have a fundamental role to play in being the kind of glue that holds communities and countries together. But at a time of crisis, like your curators and you, I was shaped by the murder of George Floyd. I was shaped by the Black Lives Matter. And as I heard people um, sometimes having misunderstandings of what these movements were, or I talked to many people who were, had no hope that, my God, you know, we've been doing this for hundreds of years. And what I realized is places like LACMA, like the Smithsonian, are places that people trust. And that in essence, what we could do is we can bring people together of different political points of view who trust these institutions, who are willing to come and grapple with it. And so I thought it was important at a time of crisis that the Smithsonian say, we're going to use our resources to help a nation find understanding, find context, find healing, and maybe even find a little hope. And so I thought that we could bring together the best scholars, work with institutions around the country to really look at how race has shaped um, our national narrative, as race continues to shape us, but in a way that says, this is the story of us all, not the story simply of one community. And that what my goal is, is to say that we can bring together the best thinkers um, and they can debate the role of Confederate monuments, or they can look at the impact mm -hmm. of slavery or Biddy Mason. And that what I want was not to sort of say, here are the simple answers, but really help people embrace ambiguity. You know, in some ways, um, often we give people simple answers to complex questions, and we see how that plays out in political landscape. What I really wanted was if we could help the public embrace ambiguity, understand subtlety, nuance, change. What a contribution you make beyond whatever the subject matter is. And so I really wanted the Smithsonian to have an explicit contemporary resonance to say that we are a place that is as much about today and tomorrow as we are about yesterday. And that our shared future is crucially important to us and that we need to be able to grapple with issues of race or mm -hmm. climate change or the impact of technology and to basically draw from that 
to find a shared, hopeful future. So for me, this is an opportunity to help, an opportunity to provide positive direction, an opportunity to provide hope. Yeah, I, I, by the way, I can't imagine a better title for any initiative right now than our <laughs> shared future. It just, I mean, just to think about that, that it is our shared future. And what struck me as so powerful in, uh, and I know this is a big initiative of the Smithsonian, Bank of America has given a huge grant, um, but both at the inception, you talked about disagreement being part of it. So we often don't come out with big initiatives and <laughs> highlight <laughs> disagreement, but the confidence with which you suggested that this cultural space that, that we can have disagreement, this is part of our shared future and that we can work through it. And I know your life has been dedicated to that. Um, as a historian, I think you've seen that play out, good and bad. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested in that confidence that you have very personally, I don't think this is an initiative that would have come out of a lot of other people, but your the sense of history, uh, and that sense of passion and future and, and the pragmatics of it. This is not an ideological thing. You've, <laughs> you've studied history, you've built museums, you've brought people together. Um, how do you, you have this incredible personal optimism on that level? Tell me about that, because we need that for our world. <laughs> well, you know, it really partly comes from, candidly, growing up in a town where I was one of the few black families. And I had to learn and navigate race at a very early age, but I also learned that by doing that, we're all made better. Um, I just, I can't believe how old I am. I just went back to my 50th high school reunion and all these kids who, you know, 50 years ago didn't talk about race or talked about it in a, in a very negative way, were talking about how they've been changed, how the work that they've seen me do and others has really helped them understand more about our shared world and our shared future. And then building the African-American Museum on the mall, what I really wanted was to say that if this is a story by black people for black people, then we failed. But if we could make a story that says, here's how we all understand our shared past and obviously look to the shared future and the success of the museum is really, I mean, people talk about, you know, yes, it's open, it's great. But to me, what gives me the optimism is that first of all, it draws one of the most diverse audiences of any museum in the world. Um, and so rather than simply be a museum for a community, it really is a museum that says, while we explore a community, it's really a nation story. And that mm -hmm. has given me great optimism and hope. And I guess the other thing that really does it is that I find so many people sending me letters um, saying, we now have a chance to understand something we didn't understand before. And I am always, as a historian, somebody who finds hope because I look back in history and I say, my goodness, look at the horrible things that happened. And yet look at people who believed in an America that didn't believe in them. Look at people who said, we can envision a world anew, a new that is not a world of slavery, but a world of freedom. And so what comes out of history to me is a sense that not a naive sort of rose colored glasses, but a sense that my goodness, we have made changes and we can make changes. It's not, it's not easy. It's not without loss. It's not without sacrifice. But I think about getting to know people like John Lewis, who always told me that the most important thing you can do is never despair. And so for me, our shared future is helping America never despair. Yes, and as you're saying this, of course, the the African American experience, all that you're talking about, it is accessible to all of us as a version of the whole world and all of world history. Because, I mean, there's so much in our past. We have to think of indigenous cultures. We have to think of the legacy of colonialism, and in that, the sort of darkness of that, we we have to find a path forward. I, I do feel, and I, maybe we're a global museum, so we're always talking about this multiculturalism, both mm -hmm. globally and locally, because LA is probably the most multicultural city on earth. You drive a few blocks and all you see is signs in Korean. Exactly. <laughs> when I do a Korean exhibition, it's very much local, global. And <laughs> I, I think about this, um, and you've set it up for the United States, that isn't this our role in the world, that we are the one 
almost every other culture is mostly monocultural. Yep. Our, our, our curse and our possibility is to find a way forward in, in, a, in a multicultural nation and find ways to negotiate difference. Like everybody has their own traditions they need to hang on to, but we can all work together. And I do feel that's the role of the museum and what you've done in this, in, in, in the African-American experience is suggest the possibilities that are larger. But I, I do believe that's our beacon in the United States to be that I, place. I agree. Out I agree with you so much. I mean, I think you're really so right on the mark. One of the things that the pandemic has allowed me to do candidly is that I've spent months reaching out, um, giving talks to, you know, the major museum directors in Ireland or in Panama, and that I've really, you, you've really captured it. People are, are wrestling with what does it mean to be inclusive? What does it mean to bring the outsider in, whether that's outsiders based on religion or culture. Um, and I think about how throughout my career working in Japan and China and South Africa really taught me about better ways to understand what America is um, mm -hmm. in terms of being able to grapple with the outsider and grapple with inclusivity. I think the great power, candidly, of many people who were considered outsiders in the United States is that they dreamed a world anew. In some ways, the impact of all these different people helped to continue to really make America live up to its stated ideals. I mean, that's been the gold standard, right? To be able to say that as a nation, you said you are this. Well, we're, we know we're not there yet, but as a work in progress, we can envision, we can protest, we can pass different laws, we can basically imagine a world anew. And that, to me, is the great power of inclusivity, the great power of helping nations around the world say, here's who you are, but how do you now imagine a world anew that is inclusive, but by being inclusive, you are better, you are stronger. Um, and so that's my hope. I mean, I am, an, I am a guy that, that is ripe with optimism. Um, that is my <laughs> well, hope for the world. You always get me riled up with that optimism too, because we, we also know like science, biz, the science of business now will tell you that the more diverse your team, the more different points of view, the more successful you're going to be. It seems natural that you're gonna solve different problems. You're gonna be able to look from many perspectives. And I guess there was in America, this sense, would we all, it would be the melting pot where we all become one. And that's one, that's not even necessarily the best path. Exactly. Because if we can, body the, and get along with the difference, I think our solutions to the future are, in, are, are going to be better. And of course, in a globalized society, there's no way we're going to solve problems like the pandemic or climate change without a global solution where we do understand different people's perspectives on it. And so it's that role of understanding. I guess that's why I'm so inspired by your initiative of our shared future. You know, you're so kind because like you, what I realize is that it's not enough to be good in the traditional ways, right? It's not enough to be the best museums in a very traditional way, but rather what we ought to do is find the right tension between tradition and innovation and basically build on what we've done well as museums, as a culture, but to recognize the opportunity to really seize new directions and to really say, why not fight for the greater good? Why not? Um, I've always felt that, you know, you're going to be criticized for something little, so you might as well get criticized for something big. <laughs> so well, I, 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 while we're on this topic of the future, um, you know, we talk a lot about when I think about the future, it's like this these last couple of years, we've gone to the future faster, which is one. <laughs> Our survival depends on inclusion of difference. And also that is hand in hand with this sort of technological future. And I know at the Smithsonian, you've also led this effort to bring the Smithsonian into the digital age. Um, again, I was mentioning that with actually with partnership with Snap Corporation, we, we 
had five artist projects recently around Los Angeles talking about, well, we're tearing down monuments, are we? What really should be memorialized, monumentalized? We didn't have time to cast bronze. So we worked together with artists to create uh, these virtual monuments, augmented reality. So you can stand in South LA in a park and, and, and look at a sculpture that's kinetic or on LACMA's campus. Um, Mercedes Durami did this beautiful piece that has Tongva chant mixed with her own family's voice and a kinetic sculpture that takes you to the sky. And as I said, Biddy Mason now floats at LACMA's campus in this <laughs> augmented reality. So can we talk about how I think we can work on this through, through, through the digital space, how we can try to make the digital space accessible? You know, in many ways, the digital space gives us that opportunity to be more nimble than museums ever have been. It gives us the opportunity to basically take greater risks um, because of the opportunity to make mid-course corrections or, um, you know, to recognize that it's not a bronze statue. Um, but what the digital space also does, and I think we've all learned this during the pandemic, you know, the Smithsonian before the pandemic would engage, you know, 40 million people would come through our doors every year. But when we closed the building and pivoted to saying the building's closed but the Smithsonian's open, suddenly we're dealing with 300 million people. Um, and so in a way, what I think this gives us is let us find that right tension. Uh, never run away from the traditions of what we do, but recognize that we have new tools, um, new opportunities to engage, but also new opportunities to be made better by that engagement, that it's no longer that one way street of um, cultural institutions saying, here's what you should know. Rather, it is an opportunity to say, how are we shaped by that artist in South Central LA who might not have traditionally been in um, Lackman's collections, but now you have a chance to demonstrate who you are. And so in some ways for me, what this allows us to do is if we believe that the work we do really matters, then we need to reach out to as many audiences as possible. And if we really believe that we're institutions that are not community centers, but we wanna be at the center of our community, um, then we've gotta be able to use that digital technology to have those communications, those relationships that allow us to sort of be a partner and a collaborator. And ultimately I think what technology allows us to do is to recognize that we can be much more nimble. We can experiment in ways we hadn't done before. We can take the chances. And I love yeah. the notion of asking the Smithsonian, if you were created today, if James Smithson gave us this money today instead of you know 150 years ago, 175 years ago, what would we look like? And the digital sphere gives us that great opportunity to rethink what we'd look like. Yeah, I mean, I think we th when we think about the emergence of museums in our society and this idea of a place to contemplate human creative production and understand each other, I mean, that's part of it, right? To, 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 to look at history, to look at each other. Um, I do think it's, it's urgent more than ever as we talk about regulating social media, maybe we do need to regulate it, but I also think we as museums need to start entering that arena as soon as possible to create this reflective and thoughtful space. Because one of the things about museum space is it's, you know, you might, you might be entertained for a moment, but then it encourages this deeper layered thought. You have to think about what statements might last, might have something to say to the future. And I hope I feel like we have to get in, occupy the space a little bit and slow it down and create more thoughtfulness to what's said in, in what is going to be so much of our reality is going to be a, a virtual reality. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, I think that the opportunity for us is for us as institutions to think, what does it really mean? You know, it's kind of like, you remember you know, early in our careers, people were just grappling with what's an exhibition, right? Um, and what's the literature of exhibition creativity? You know, there was all this film criticism that you could read, but not exhibition criticism. But I would argue now it really is think about in a different way, what does that digital space mean? Um, what's it do best? How is it really an opportunity to provide the public tools that they can use effectively? Um, how is it that space that really allows for that the messiness of 
contestation um, and collaboration. Um, and so what I'm fascinated by is watching museums, watching artists help us figure out what are the best things we can do with that digital space. Much like we learned, we never want to do exhibitions that were simply books on the wall. We want to right. learn what are the best uses of that digital space. And that's really one of the most exciting things I see occurring today. Yeah, I mean, we will change what museums are. We also have to be conscious that as we're out in digital space, you know, there's a safe space of walking onto a campus or a museum building where there's a certain set of rules, a kind of respectfulness, thoughtfulness. I think one of the things is how we need to create that in this other space. Exactly. <laughs> a lot of the, the, you know, I think that the stress of the digital space is that there isn't yet a kind of just not an order of what to think, but different modes of thinking. Yep. Um, yep. And museums provide that for our society. And we've learned this in exhibitions. I think we've learned enough in the real space that we can apply that learning, the, the two-way conversation, all these things that are critical, thinking about many communities, many points of view. Um, but, it, but it is hard to uh, negotiate, I think, how we're gonna build this thoughtfulness into that a chaotic space. Because I think you're right. You use the word chaotic. I would describe it as rough and tumble, right? <laughs> that there's so much going on and so much um, sometimes extremism. Um, and that in essence, part of what I think the strength of cultural institutions are is that we have to provide that sense of order or measure disorder. Um, and I think that in a way that's our challenge moving forward because I think that's the great need of that space. And what I, I know you and I have spent a lot of time talking to, you know, younger kids, younger generations, how they use this space. And one of the things that I'm always struck by is when people say to me, when kids say to me, we really want to understand the authentic through the lens of the digital. Um, and so in essence, there is an element where people want us to help them make sense of that new space. So we've got to figure that out how we can be yeah. of great help as people sort of grapple with this rough and tumble space that is social media. Well, and there's no, I, I think we know even from surveys, there's probably no more trusted organization in America than the Smithsonian. I mean, both the, from the arts, from history, from science, research. Um, and I guess therefore it is, I mean, we, we, we all need the Smithsonian to help us uh, think this through. And again, it's not, it's not like order one way. It's 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 a slowing down to consider the possibilities in a thoughtful way, right? That's the that's what's I think the hardest in this digital space. And I think the Smithsonian. I mean, I know you're doing so much in that area, but I think I, I have a lot of hopefulness about the Smithsonian's role in being the the kind of steadying force in that space. Well, I think that in many ways the Smithsonian has been that trusted source, right, for 175 years. It's been a place that has often been about the future, whether it was helping the Wright brothers figure out how to fly or whether it was really sort of helping contemporary art have a place on the National Mall. Um, and so in many ways, what I hope the Smithsonian will always be is that place that matters, that matters in helping people find that shared future. And right now, to find that shared future, part of that is having the candid opportunity to explore difficult issues, to see our past and our present through different lenses, but also to sort of really figure out how to use that social media space um, as the tool that helps us all better understand who we once were, understand better who we are today, and point us towards that shared future. Yeah, and I think we need to conjure the past in a new way, too, through images in that space, because so much, I always feel that if if we didn't leave so much out, if we could fill in the gaps of the things lost, yeah. uh, mom, moms <laughs> that right. were so key to <laughs> the famous people <laughs> that we know. And then if we can use our this space and education and artists, um, again, I'm just, I was just so touched by this Biddy Mason portrait. Maybe, I mean, you you said anything related to Biddy Mason is exciting. Maybe you, you could, talk a little about your own work as a historian, just to close and, and how you've done that in your own scholarship is to make the, the invisible visible. I mean, she's just one example, right? 
Exactly. I mean, I, I have been very fortunate. Um, I've got to do what I love, right? Which is to make sure those that are anonymous are anonymous no more. Um, and often that was issues of race, but not simply issues of race. And for me, being in Los Angeles was pivotally important to my scholarship, but also my career. Obviously being, you know, the founding curator of the California African American Museum, helping to build it, being part of the Olympic Arts Festival, which introduced me to the amazing cultural possibilities of Los Angeles, um, but also allowing me to create work that looked at the history of Blacks in the Olympics. But also I created something called, um, it seems so creative then, Black America and the California Dream. Um, and the notion was to let's look at Oakland, Berkeley, and Richmond, look at the Inland Empire, but of course, look at Los Angeles. And I did so much work, wrote so many scholarly articles and books about Los Angeles, and was really fascinated by Biddy Mason, by this woman who came as an enslaved woman, who gained her freedom in part because free Blacks in Los Angeles and in San Bernardino helped her navigate the legal system to gain her freedom, and then how she used that freedom to both help build a community, but also to serve Los Angeles. I mean, I think I'm always struck by the great floods of the 1880s and Biddy Mason, you know, rallies support and money to help the city rebuild. So in many ways, this is a story of an individual woman's um, experience from slavery to freedom, but it's also the impact of how one person can help reshape a city that is now a city that we all love, the city of Los Angeles. Uh, well, a Ada Pinkston's uh, The Artist's Digital um, Monument does conjure some of that and gives reason to focus as it gave me reason to start to research that history. And it changed my life in thinking about Los Angeles too. So we need more of you and that. Uh, I think we need to get you to LA more often. And maybe as I'm thinking about the Olympics, sorry, just to speculate, the Olympics are coming back to Los Angeles. Maybe we need to partner with the Smithsonian and your experience uh, about history, culture connected to that global um, event and make it local global in ways that I think uh, you, could, you could help with. <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna put another project on your plate. <laughs> Work well, us. but I would I would love to because I have to be honest. The Olympics, in some ways, transformed the city of Los Angeles in the 1940 games, the 1984 games, in ways we had anticipated. Right? Um, I think, in some ways, it really gave a boost to the cultural community. Um, mm -hmm. Suddenly, institutions, large and small, are thinking about you know how do they represent Los Angeles, how they share the culture um, of the community, and then I think the notion of sort of using something like the Olympics to reimagine the city, reimagine its history, reimagine its future. So I'm very, I'm very excited. I mean, I, like I said, being in Los Angeles profoundly shaped everything about me. Even my kids were born in LA. So um, everything about me has been shaped by Los Angeles. So anything I can do, I'm always there. Okay, well, and another of these virtual monuments by Glenn Kino, another LA artist, is all about the Olympics. So there's a big conversation. Maybe we can uh, think about that for our shared future and uh, sort of build the Olympics into that. Because it is, again, I know that you mean by that, um, not just local, not just national, but just it's, it's ours as humanity. Um, and, it, and we do live in this very globalized world. So we have a lot of work to do. Luckily, it have a partner like you makes all that work worthwhile. Okay, so more work to do. Our to-do list has just grown. <laughs> I'm very grateful, Lonnie, for your the time you're taking with us here. We're very grateful in Los Angeles that you and the National Portrait Gallery shared these Obama portraits with us that will change, I'm sure, so many lives. We have a an initiative, Access Art, that one of our trustees started. We're going to try to get 10,000 students young people to, to see these portraits. We're going to extend our hours. We're gonna make sure that they, um, that they have the greatest possible impact on, on the future of Los Angeles and our shared future. So I, I really deeply thank you for, for sharing them with us. And thank you for your leadership. It means so much to me. It means so much to the city of Los Angeles and to the nation. So thank you. <laughs>